Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And on our panel tonight, one of the leading Brexiteers on the Conservative backbenches, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Labour's Shadow Justice Secretary, Richard Bergen, the co-leader of the Green Party, Caroline Lucas, the Mirror Colonist, Susie Boniface, and David Cameron's former Director of Communications during the EU referendum, Craig Oliver. And uh, just a reminder, you can join in from home, of course, our hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, on Facebook, our text number 83981. And our first question from Beth astley Sarugi, please. Does the panel agree with David Cameron that it is selfish to give the public sector a pay rise? David Cameron said this week it was uh, selfish to give the public... It was selfish to claim that a public sector pay rise was uh, acceptable. It wasn't. Um, who should start on this? Caroline Lucas, you start. Well, I'll tell him what selfish is. Selfish is when you spend £26,000 on a garden shed. Selfish is when you <laughs> roll out austerity and you are meanwhile getting around £100,000, is it, for every speech that you make. I mean, quite frankly, how dare he say that? You know, people are absolutely struggling. And we know that when it comes to the NHS, for example, we've got more nurses and midwives leaving the NHS now than they are joining for the very first time. We've got a crisis in our NHS and we are taking our public sector workers for granted. They are being treated with contempt by this government. So absolutely, we should be investing in those public services. Come on, we are the, what is it, the fifth biggest economy in the world and are we saying we can't properly pay public sector workers who've been struggling for so long? And to see Theresa May, you know, lecture that nurse actually in a programme that you were doing, David, and saying there's no magic money tree. Well, do you know what? The cat is out of the bag because we saw with the agreement with the DUP, there certainly is a magic money tree and it's worth about £1.5 billion. <laughs> Caroline Lucas. Of course, uh, what he actually said was giving up on sound finances isn't being generous, it's being selfish. Giving up on sound finances, you think it'd be perfect well, do you think, sound Do you think spend? the last seven years has been sound finances from this government? I mean, they've missed every single target that they set themselves when it came to getting rid of the deficit. They have absolutely driven this country into okay. uh, pretty much chaos when it comes to public services. I would love to see sound, sound finances, but I don't see it coming from this government. Jacob rees <laughs> Um I think you've got to work out where we started from. But when the Conservatives got in in 2010, a Labour minister said there is no money left. The deficit was £150 billion. Things had to be done that were difficult and unpopular and were difficult for the people suffering from them. Nobody wants to have a situation where hard-working people aren't getting pay increases. The government doesn't do this because it's unkind. It does it because we had to get the public finances in order. Do you realise that debt interest that we pay every year is now more than the wage bill for the NHS. That's the scale of the problem. And the government then has choices, and we as voters have choices. If you want to increase pay in the public sector, you have to work out where the money comes from. It could come uh, from increased taxation. But we currently have the highest level of tax as a percentage of GDP that we've had since the uh, late 1960s. The top 3,000 taxpayers pay as much in income tax as the lowest 9 million taxpayers. There is only a certain amount that you can get from them. So if that's can... true, what do you make of what's been going on this week, which is the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, two senior no. members of the... Say, hinting or I'll, saying directly I will that, come we to should, that, but it's that really the government important, should give way? It's really important to look at the options, because that's one option, is increased taxation. The other is that we borrow more and our children pay for it. Now, having just had another child, I don't think it's really fair that the first thing I should say to him is you're going to pay to make my political life a little bit easier. And the third thing you can do is reallocate from other priorities. 
Um, somebody mentioned HS2. I happen to agree that that would not be my priority for spending. I personally... <laughs> I personally would raid the overseas aid budget, which I think is too big. <laughs> and, 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 and I look forward to the £10 billion a year net that we will get back once we leave the European Union. So that... What, I mean, what, what do you make of what seems to be going on in government at the moment with these voices saying she should give way, she should be more liberal in the public sector pay? But I, I mentioned Boris Johnson, I mentioned Michael Gove. Well, you have to look at public sector pay in amongst these choices and in amongst what will be happening to the economy. But I'm if asking we get, about the government. Yes, that's right, but let me... Have they got one voice or six voices? They have one voice because they're bound by collective responsibility. They're not doing very well, and, it? Well, right. um, we have a former spokesman who knows how difficult it is sometimes to get I do. Uh, everybody singing quite in tune, though it's probably best if politicians don't sing. Uh, but the government understands that these difficult choices are there. What Boris um, Johnson and Michael Gove has been saying is that they are recognising that there is a pressure and that this leads to the debate that we are having now. But ladies and gentlemen, ultimately it's up to you. Which of those choices do you want to make? Do you want to risk even higher taxes? Do you want to risk higher borrowing? Or would you go with what would be my solution and reallocate from other areas that are, to right. my mind, a lower priority? Okay. Woman there, woman at the back there, on the right at the back, yes. Um, being as you said that we haven't got a magic money tree, can you just define why you've actually given 1.5 billion to Northern Ireland okay, and well, how you're actually going to, to, to pay that, that back? No, no, you can't. Well, no, you can't to answer that. We'll come on to it. Richard Burger. I, I'd love to. Yes, I know you would, but you've been <laughs> speaking some length already. It's good to be at the Jacob Rees Mogg show. So, uh, it makes some interesting points, but what he did say was that there are difficult choices to be made. And when a Conservative, whether it be Theresa May, whether it be Boris Johnson or Jacob, says there are difficult choices to make, that's usually a code for cuts and bad news for those who can least afford it. And our public sector workers who work in our hospitals, who work in our fire stations, who work in our schools, are a bit sick of patronising pats on the head from Conservative politicians every time there's a terrible disaster or every time the exam results come round because what they need is not to be thanked by Conservative politicians because they get thanked by members of the public every day. What they need is a real pay rise because their pay hasn't stood still. Their pay has gone down. Nurses, for example, are having 14% less in real terms pay than in 2010 in the stories of nurses uh, using uh, food banks. And when it comes to what's selfish, I think David Cameron personifies selfishness for many reasons, but partly because he selfishly walked away after he'd left this country in an absolute mess. Okay. Uh, let's, just hear from, let's just hear from Craig Oliver, who I said was... Cameron's spokesman through this. Have you spoken to Cameron about this comment that he made? I haven't spoken to him specifically about this. Unfortunately, I don't have to defend everything David Cameron says anymore. But what I would say is I do think that we're coming to a time, and I think the Conservative government is probably recognising that you can't keep squeezing the public sector in the way that it has been. People have had a re real terms pay cut, and you know there's a struggle to fill nurses and teachers' jobs. But the point that I think is really important here is exactly what you were saying about the Cabinet. We cannot have Cabinet members going out there and making up policy on the hoof and pretending that there is, frankly, no choice to be made. There's no difficulty to be made. What needs to happen is the government needs to be talking in private, making those hard choices, and then making the case. Because at the moment, they're looking like they have no plan and they have no message. When it comes so Cameron's got it wrong, in your view, by saying sound finances are what matters. No, and I think that actually it was slightly disingenuous to say that he said that people didn't deserve a pay cut. What he was saying... A pay is, rise. Pay rise, I'm sorry. But what he was saying was, what is desperately unfair is that we spend tomorrow's money today, because as Jacob was saying, that is really going to affect our children and our grandchildren, and that is not okay. fair. But those people are paying tax. Can we just remember... But when those people are being paid a pay rise, they therefore pay more tax on that pay rise. So we don't have a situation where taxpayers are over here and public sector workers are over there. Public sector workers are paying tax. 
tax, and that goes back into the revenue, and that creates more money, which you can then invest. So this idea that the money simply isn't there is wrong. And if you want to look at another place to find it, then look at corporation tax. Why are we reducing corporation tax yet further <laughs> to be some kind of basically a tax haven floating off the side of Europe. That is no vision for what this country should be, trying to get down to 17% corporation tax. Corporations should pay their way. So not you putting you're basically the saying countries. that we should borrow more money? No, I'm saying corporations should be paying more money. And I'm saying if you paid people more money, they would then pay more tax Susie, on it. And you get a virtuous Susie circle. Boniface. I love hearing somebody who works for an investment bank talk about borrowing money. Um, let's just cut through the rubbish for a moment and get back to Beth's original question. Yes, it's selfish. Jo Jacob, did you take the 10% pay rise in 2015? Uh, I Caroline? No, Caroline didn't. didn't. Richard, you were freshly in Parliament then, I believe. Well, we don't agree with austerity for everyone yes else. No. So it's not, it? well, it's, it's not yes hypocrisy no. because. Take the pay rise? Well, we, we yes talk. Or no. Let me answer the question. Yes or let, no. let, 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 let me answer the question. Let, let, my question. I, I, will, I will answer your question on, then, because, as I'm a politician, I'm one of the, the few members of society that's uh, trusted even less than journalists. But what I, would say, what, I, what I would say is that the difference is we're not saying that MPs deserve the independently uh, provided, uh, independently decided upon pay rise and that other people don't deserve it. We're saying that our public sector workers deserve a pay rise and the real yeah. story of hypocrisy... Sorry, her question wasn't that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for the Richard Bergen show for a moment. Caroline's right. The public sector is the only group of individuals, and there's five million of them in this country, and they're the only group of people who pay for their own pay rises. None of the rest of us have to do that, any other organisation. And we should really stop this business that we've been going on now for seven years of demonising the people who administer our pensions, who sort out the roundabouts, who provide the nursing, who keep us safe with the police force, who make sure our houses don't all burn to the ground and go back in and pull us out when they do, and stop saying they are the reason that we're in all this problem. We, we do not have a huge amount of problems because of the public sector. The public sector is what stops us being just a group of individuals who live on a rock in the North Sea. The public sector is doing something for other people is what makes us a society. Without them, we're just feral. All we right. need to say thank you to them and thank you very much for everything that you do. I'd like to hear from our audience. I'd like to go back to the question, actually, first, and then, and then hear from others. What do you make of it? I think it was disgraceful that David Cameron was insinuating or even said that. I think the public sector is what keeps this country going. It's vital. The government can't keep saying, oh, you know, the heroes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then not back that up by giving them a pay rise. Right. It's and disgraceful. The man over there on the, on, the, on the corner, you, sir, in the middle, yes. Yep. 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 I mean, du during the last eight years or so of Conservative lead, leadership, and eight years of cuts, we're still blaming, the Conservatives are still blaming Labour for the deficit. The deficit has actually tripled during that time. I mean, you know, what's the, what's the reason for that? How can they still be blaming them? And, and the man next to you. Um, firstly, I'd like to congratulate Jacob on the birth of his sixth Thank child. Um, <laughs> but I also want to ask him, obviously he can afford to clothe, feed and educate six children. What does he have to say about the nurses and other members of the NHS who can't afford to feed themselves and, and house themselves as well? All right. Uh, well, OK, Jacob, you answer that. And then... Uh, uh, yes. Um, there is a slight misunderstanding, I think, that the pay cap doesn't mean that people aren't getting any pay rises, that there are grade increments, and the average level five nurse has received a 3.8% increment increase on top of the 1% guideline increase. So where the cut has been is on a new entrant. So if you were a new entrant in 2010 and a new entrant now, you get 5% less in real terms than you did in 2010. But as in the period that you've been working for the NHS, you will have got grade increments, you will not have had that real right. terms pay cut. And, and that's a very important percent. point. Um, on, the, on my own personal affairs, which I don't think are very relevant, no, well, uh, but I will answer because question. I've been challenged. I've been yeah. challenged. It's only fair that I answer. <laughs> I take no personal living expenses at all that MPs are entitled to. I have always refused to take those because I don't think that you should subsidise my lifestyle because I can afford it. And that was my decision. But other MPs are not in that position and they ought to get... Uh, an right. amount to help them with second homes and, to sell. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd, like to hear from, I'd like to hear from, because you're a, an audience right across the political spectrum, I'd like to hear from somebody who supports what Cameron said, that, uh, that, that <laughs> sound finances, <laughs> sound finances uh, are, are important 
Let me hear from somebody who thinks that you, sir, there, yes. There's a gentleman over here just said that um, the deficit's gone up by three times under Conservative government. It hasn't. The debt's risen, the deficit's closed. They are two totally different things. And I hear so many people on the television mixing the two up. We still have a deficit. And Caroline Lucas has said we should bring down corporation tax. Put, uh, put, it, put up. it up, sorry. <laughs> France have announced today they're bringing theirs down. We've got a lot of competitors out there. So, you know, we have to be very careful what we do. We're in choppy waters and we do need some sensible people at the helm. Okay. And, and the, the person at the very back there. Yes. Um, I'm not saying I agree with what David Cameron says. I'm agreeing with him that says it's not just doctors that are getting the pay increase, not getting a pay increase. It's everybody as a whole. I know there's teachers that haven't had pay increases. They're, if you work out their annual wage and you work it by hourly, they're actually getting paid less than the living wage. So it's not just doctors. It's actually everyone collectively is not getting a pay increase. Craig Oliver, how hard done by do you think the public sector is compared with the private? Well, the evidence is that actually the public sector is actually doing a bit better than the private sector at the moment. The um, and there, there has been reports in the last few days saying that. Do you think they're doing better, Richard? I think it's really important that we don't try and divide working people into the public sector and the private sector and, and, try, and, get one to re and try to get one to resent the other. The truth is, most people, whether working in the public sector or in the private sector, haven't been getting the deal they deserve since 2010, have seen their living standards, have seen their living standards uh, reduced. I make no apologies for praising people in the public sector and the private sector. Businesses and employ people. And let me you live it. in a bubble. Okay. You live in a Westminster bubble where you don't know the real world. Okay, you start? don't pay let's, business rates. You don't pay David. pensions. David, You're in a bubble. No, no, you are in a bubble, point. I'm afraid. It's, you've got to stop realising there are people self-employed in this country that generate growth, whether they employ one person or 50 people. All I ever hear is let's look after the public sector. Do you know what it's like running your own business? You don't, because you're a politician. You haven't got a clue. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Firstly, I do live in the real world. I live in Leeds, the constituency I represent. And secondly, if you let me answer, you're right about the importance of small business. And Labour does talk about it. That's why in our manifesto, one of our policies was to bring in paternity pay maternity pay and sick pay for the self-employed because oh, we do because we, we do hang on sir let for him the have, let him have his say. for the self-employed and, and that's the point you're making it, richard no self-employed person can cease close down their company and take a year off because they've had a child i'm self-employed i'm afraid i don't employ other people i just work for myself but i had a child last year uh, the statutory maternity pay is 100 pounds a week i would have been on the street within three months if i'd relied upon that and also when i went back to work if i'd taken a year off i'd have found i had no customers no clients no nothing i'd have been absolutely on my ass <laughs> It's not right that people who are self-employed don't get these benefits when they pay national insurance as well. So I think it's important that they have those rights and the government would have given them those rights. Place, so when I go back to that's a but that's a decision that people who are self-employed should be able to make by introducing paternity pay, maternity pay and All sick right. pay. That would help them make the decision. I want to go to the man in the green shirt there. I'll come to you, Caroline. Suitably green after him. Yes. We're you, talking sir. about... We're talking about Cameron's, Cameron's speech. He used the word selfish about public sector workers. I've worked in schools and children's services for 40 years. If Cameron wants to see selfless people get into a school, get into a hospital, he'll see people working selflessly. He'll see people working past their hours. If he wants to see that kind of thing and say that kind of thing and earn the right to say, yeah. get I just out think and it, see I think them. It, look, They're look, there. It's, it's, really, it's really important that you actually look at what David Cameron said. And what David Cameron said was stacking up the deficit, stacking up debt, which is £1.7 trillion, is what is selfish. He did not accuse public sector workers of being selfish in any way, and it is wrong to say that. OK, let's, let's go... Somebody, somebody proposes a solution to this. Um, Peter Bright. Should we reduce or scrap the foreign aid budget to help solve funding issues closer to home? 
Could we reduce or scrap the foreign aid budget to help solve funding issues closer to home? Uh, you've touched on that, Jacob, already, so I'll come to you in a moment. But Caroline Lucas. No, I, I don't think we should, and that's for two reasons. <laughs> First of all, Britain has a proud tradition of being a country that cares about the development in poorer countries. Britain also has a bit of a record, unfortunately, of having caused quite a few problems in poorer countries, and therefore some justice and some recompense wouldn't go amiss. But you know what? There's also a, a, a question here about what's in our own self-interest. And if we care about a world where people can feel secure wherever they live, if we care about a world where people don't have to risk their lives on boats going across the Mediterranean, and there's over 2,000 people who've risked their lives and, and died in the Mediterranean over this year alone, if we want to live in a safer world overall, then I think the money we put into our aid budget is money incredibly well spent. OK. Uh, and you actually want to... For the election, I think you wanted to increase it from 13 billion to somewhere around 16 billion, didn't you? We wanted it to go to, to 1%, right. yeah. Well, well how, many, how many billion yeah. would that be? I think, as you say, 13 billion, yeah. Up from 13 to 16? Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, right. Um, Jacob Rees Mogg. Well, I can give a one word answer, yes. <laughs> um, I, th I think there are real problems. Sorry, they can't give a one-word answer because it was reduce or scrap. Well, it should be reduced or scrapped, but it reduced. I, 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 would, I would maintain. All right, I would maintain emergency relief, which I think only the government can do. Uh, and I think there are some elements of the overseas aid budget where money has been very well spent. The money on um, camps near Syria to provide people with a place of refuge when they are fleeing in fear of their lives. I think is something we should be proud of what our country has done. Um, sponsoring the Ethiopian Spice Girls and the various other things where money has gone are not money well spent. And I think that should be done by, ladies and gentlemen, your private charity. All of you, I expect, give to charity and you can choose. It's not for politicians to take your money in general taxation <laughs> and give it to charitable causes. But if you want development, and my background is as an emerging markets investor, what you want to help countries succeed is trade. South Korea is the most wonderful and impressive nation. After the Korean War, its GDP per capita was lower than Somaliland. It is now an OCD, OECD nation. It's one of the 30th richest countries in the world. And it's done that by trade, because we were willing to buy their goods and mm. that's a great opportunity to come to a subject we may come to later, mm. once we're out of the European Union and take away all the customs tariffs that we impose still on developing nations to help them boost themselves but by selling you, um, us things we want. Yeah, and, and Peter Bright's question was uh, to help solve funding issues closer to home. Are you arguing that we should cut the 13 billion that goes abroad and use it for the nurses and for the teachers? Well, you've got to be very careful, Just because I don't want to fall into the trap of spending the same money many times. And you may notice that politicians do this. They say, cut the overseas aid budget, and then they're going to pay for nurses and teachers and a new hospital and more money on the defence services and so on and so forth. So I think you've got to work out what your choice is, where would you put it? And where would you... And I think at the moment, I would put it into housing. I think that is the <laughs> greatest <laughs> issue facing our nation, um, obviously following what happened in Grenfell Tower, and I think there is going to need to be significant government expenditure in that area, and I think that would be a sensible way to find it and apply it. Craig Oliver. I think the foreign aid budget is a very easy target for people, and they seem to think that it, you can just take it and it'll apply to all our problems and everything will be solved. But I think we live in a compassionate country, and I think we also made a promise to some of the poorest people in the world and you see projects like the Gavi project, which deals with malaria. It's done an amazing job out there. And if compassion isn't really doing it for you, then there's our national security. I saw when we were in government that Ebola, which was a real threat to the world, was solved because British money went into Liberia and Sierra Leone, and it made a real difference. And at a time when this country is considering Brexit, I would say using soft power around the world, we're going to need as much friends as we can, so it's money well spent. Okay. Yeah. What? Exactly. I'll get to the question of Peter Bright. What do you think? Uh, I think when times are really difficult, like with all the public spending issues we have right now, I don't think it would be a bad thing to have a dynamic foreign aid budget. So when times are good, we can 
give a little bit more and when times are tough and we need to sort out some problems at home, maybe we could scale it back a little bit and help the nurses and teachers so, and doctors. Right. Um, well, Peter, in answer to your question, I don't think it should be reduced or scrapped. I don't think it's an either or some that it's us or them, but I can, do think you can render it totally unnecessary to have a foreign aid budget in the first place. Now, as Jacob mentioned, emergency relief, which always gets forgotten about, people talk about foreign, scrapping foreign aid, going to help people in disaster zones. I don't think anybody wants to scrap that. We have to protect that part of the budget. But the other part of emergency uh, foreign aid, which people often complain about, the Ethiopian Spice Girls funding and this kind of thing, I've been in disaster areas where I've seen the aid come in off a plane, go in a warehouse and come out the back again being sold on. I've seen corrupt regimes being propped up by governments in what they call soft power, uh, and it's wrong and it's not fair and it's not reasonable. It's not where we should have our money being spent. But what we could do is if we spent every single penny of that part of the foreign aid budget on schools. If we, put, we could put a school, the entire West World could put a school in every village in the world. We could educate every child and in 20 years they wouldn't need our help anymore. They would be able to lift themselves out of whatever problems they have. We wouldn't have to keep funding them. That would surely be the best long-term aim is to ensure that we don't have to keep throwing aid at corrupt regimes uh, and, you know, the Dell boys who are selling aid out the back of warehouses. I'm Danish and I've lived here for 30 years. I see people here squabbling over aid to countries that are poorer than we are. We do not want for anything. The easiest thing to solve this problem is the government or the next politicians on the next election to say 1p more income tax. That will solve the problem. Rather than scaremongering and go, you have to pay more tax if anybody else comes in. Okay. Richard Bergen. Well, I think we need to be able to be proud of Britain's role in the world when it comes to supporting some of the poorest people in the world and some of the people living through situations that thank goodness we don't have to live through but I think sometimes it is easy to uh, assume that uh, if we didn't have a foreign aid budget then all these awful things that have happened in this country because of the government's unnecessary political decisions wouldn't happen. The bedroom tax doesn't exist because of the foreign aid budget. The fact that people don't get paid a real living wage doesn't exist because of the foreign aid budget. The housing crisis doesn't exist because of the foreign aid budget. And the failure of the state locally and nationally to give the proper support to people after the Grenfell Tower disaster is nothing to do with the foreign aid budget. Okay. Um, um, we're, halfway, we're halfway through our programme, so I'm going to... Can I just say me, one thing? Yeah, I, say I, one I just, thing. Well, I just want to say, having worked for a development organisation for 10 years, I just want to challenge the, the, the view of development and, and, and aid that's been given, particularly by, by Susie just now. Of course, there are some places where corruption happens. Of course, there are, and that is wrong. But also, I just want to say that there is so much positive stories to be told about our aid budget and the way in which it is supporting women's empowerment, for example. And I also want to say it isn't just to do with charity. There is a question here about justice. For years and years, this country has essentially had a trade policy which is undermining the lives of poorer people in poorer countries because we are basically exporting goods into their markets which undermine the prices that their farmers get for it. So there is something here about justice. It's not just about charity. We live in a very, very interconnected world. We've had an impact on the rest of the world. Some of it's good, but some of it is less good, and it's about time we address that as well. Right. I just, I, I want to go on, but I, we've get, we get this question time and again, we've get it ever since the election, before the election. I just want to show of hands and see if you could, uh, how many of you believe in what Peter Bright suggested, reducing or scrapping the foreign aid budget? Could you stick your hands up and let's just see. And how many of you think we should keep it as, as it is? Yeah, it's pretty evenly divided. Thank you very much. Um, Question time, we're off the air over the summer. Uh, question time is back on Thursday the 14th of September, just to say this so you know where things stand. Uh, it's not too early to apply. We've, we're going to be in um, Stratford in East London and Bridgewater in Somerset on the 21st. So if you want to apply, you can go online. The, the address is there. Let's go on with another question. Um, Ashmal Kamar, please. Let's have your question, can we? OK. Um, given that 48% voted Remain, why is a hard Brexit being seen as the will of the people? Ah, uh, well, um, Craig Oliver, you were the man there right through the campaign and lost 48%. Um, 
Why do you think why do you think a hard Brexit is being considered the will of the people, if indeed it is? Well, look, I accept that Remain lost the referendum, and I also accept that we are going to leave the EU. But what I don't accept is that we need to have an ideological hardline Brexit. It's a real problem for this country, and I worry that the government is putting red lines ahead of realism and is putting um, principle before practical necess necessity. I was talking to somebody in the cabinet the other day, and they told me that Liam Fox is struggling to come up with any evidence that he will do international trade deals that will in any way balance out leaving the single market and the customs union. We're in a situation where inflation is rising at the moment because our currency is dropping because of Brexit. There's been a 75% drop in investment in the car industry. 96% fewer nurses uh, are from the EU are applying to come to Britain. Now, Chris Patton was talking about the general election. He said that the Conservative Party was overconfident and they thought it was going to be a walk in the park and it turned out to be a walk in the cemetery. Let's, not make, let's make sure we don't make the same mistake on Brexit. OK. And what, what do you make of, the, of this week's poll that says 54% would now vote to remain in the EU? Well, I think it's extremely... And you feel you screwed up pretty badly. No, I think it's extremely volatile out there, and I think anybody who trusts an opinion poll at the moment, as we were saying before the programme, it's a, you know, it's a pretty tricky time. Po opinion polls are not very accurate at the moment. But what I do think is clear, I spend a lot of my time talking to businesses, and they're incredibly worried about the fact that they can't move people in and out of this country, and they're saying we might have to move our headquarters abroad because of this. Now, people who want to be ideological about that need to listen to that, because we need a Brexit that works for the economy and jobs and not for ideology. All right. uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, you are either in the European Union or you leave it. And this is... Yeah. Um, this, is, this is not only my view, this is the view of Donald Tusk, one of the presidents of the European Union, who said there is no such thing as hard and soft Brexit, there is being in the European Union or out. And if we're out of the European Union, we cannot have our laws determined by the European Court of Justice. We cannot have all our regulations set by being in the internal market. And we can't lose all our trading opportunities by being in the customs union. And this was clear at the election. I brought a quotation, in case this came up, from Wolfgang Schäuble, a very senior German politician. And he let the cat out of the bag after the referendum, because he said he'd been asked to say this by uh, one George Osborne, the then Chancellor. And he said, if the majority in Britain opt for Brexit, that would be a decision against the single market. In is in, out is out. We knew what we were voting for. We voted... <laughs> And democracy, and democracy must deliver. Now, what Sir Craig was talking about with companies, that's then our own immigration policy. We could have an immigration policy that makes it easy for senior executives to come in and go, or we could have a lunatic one that stops them coming in. But that's got nothing to do with being in the European Union. Indeed, we could have a better one because we could have the same for Americans and Australians and Indians as we have for Belgians and Romanians and Bulgarians. And that would be our choice. It would be nothing to do with the EU. And we can deal with inflation because we have very high tariffs on food and on clothing and on footwear. So the Some word hard the... Brexit doesn't actually mean anything to you? Uh, hard Brexit is a term used by people who don't want us to lose the, leave the European Union and regret the result. And that they is... pretend that there is a that soft is... Brexit. Jacob, you've, you've, you've said something tonight that's simply not true. You're saying it's absolutely binary and that you can't leave the EU and actually have some of the benefits of it. Well, you can. You could decide to have the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, have some jurisdiction. You could choose to have the customs unit. Now, I've been told that in government, they understand that you would have to increase trade with far-flung markets by 4,000% to balance the problems of leaving the customs union in the single market. You are taking people for fools if you are claiming that it is just simply a binary decision and it's not going to have any impact on economy because it is already. This is terminological inexactitude. The truth is that if we still have our laws determined by the European Court of Justice, then our Parliament 
is no longer able to make all our laws and the votes of the British people do not count because our laws are made and interpreted that by a foreign nonsense. court. We're under the, the ECJ, ECJ now and we make laws. We are under the ECJ now and we voted to leave. Nonsense. We cannot allow our law to be overturned by Brussels if we have left the European <laughs> Union. It is, it, it is, it is not only... Jacob, you it, said... It is not only a binary decision, it is a most obviously binary one. Who your judges are, who interprets your law, is fundamental Jacob. to whether you are an independent Jacob. nation we or not. Set, we set Reagan. tax in this country, we set security in this country, defence, education, health. Once you get well, I'm past glad that, there is just very the little okay. that the European... The okay. European well, I'm, I'm so glad that. that we set tax in this country. We can't set the tax rate on women's sanitary uh, items because that's determined by the European S Union. S Susan, uh, Susan uh, isn't it wonderful that a referendum that was called in order to stop the Tories arguing has done such a brilliant job? They're fighting like cats in a sack. If we ever do Brexit, they won't know what to argue about at their dinner parties, will they? The fact is that Brexit, whether you voted leave or remain, was not a win or lose situation. You were at a fork in the road and we opted for one fork. Um, and now we're in this situation, we're all going down that fork and you're, it's time for bed. <laughs> This is my stopwatch saying it's bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Uh, we've gone down a fork, and the fact is that Brexit is now the most important issue of a generation. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect most of us in this room particularly that much. It's going to affect our children and our grandchildren far more than it does us. And this is a situation where politicians who are sitting here bitching and arguing, frankly, about stuff they can't necessarily know the answer to, should put their egos and their ideologies to one side, all our parties should come together in a rainbow coalition and get us through this next period of Brexit together for our best interests, not in theirs. Okay. You sit up there, in, in, the, in the third row from the back, with spectacles on, the man there. Yes, it's you. Yes, I can't believe we're still arguing about Brexit after the recent tragedies. We're going out of Europe and that's it. And the, about the time we realised that. OK. And, and you in the front here. I think the problem is, actually, the Leave guys didn't know what they were campaigning for, so those of us voting also didn't really know what was going to happen. It was a campaign based on, we, we're going to leave the EU, hopefully, but we don't really know what's going to happen after that. So, the hard Brexit, soft Brexit, the people that voted to stay, generally, were the young people that are actually going to be affected by it, and you're just going, doesn't matter about you lot, it's fine, we're going to go for the hard Brexit. <laughs> Get on with it. Yeah. You know, you might kids, grandkids, you're going to have to live with it. Richard Bergen. Well, Britain is leaving the European Union. Labour did campaign, as everyone knows, passionately uh, for, a remain, passionately. for a remain <laughs> and reform <laughs> agenda. It was it, it was passionate. The fact, the fact is, the fact, the fact is. The, the, the fact is, Jeremy Corbyn and his team toured the length and breadth of the country, putting forward the argument that it should remain in the European Union, Very but reform quietly. it to make it more democratic and so it's run more in the interests of the majority of people. However, the vote has taken place, Labour respects and, accept, and accepts the outcome of the referendum, Britain is leaving the European Union. And at a time when we've had years and years of trust in politicians reducing, I think it would be very, very dangerous to, for the political establishment to be perceived as trying to wriggle out of a decision and saying to people, vote again and again until you get the answer uh, that the MPs but want. Do you think, do you but think what Labour's kind view of, we stay in the single market still, though? Well, what Labour wants is an economy uh, first Brexit, a jobs first Brexit, and what we want is tariff-free access to the single market and the equivalent benefit as if it, of being in the customs union. And that means that there's going to be a lot of tough negotiating uh, to take place. You think, no, you think the EU are just sort of posturing when they say you can't do that? Well, I know that the EU has said that uh, uh, Britain has to be uh, in the single market uh, and that's come what may, but that's the point of negotiations. There's 18 months of these negotiations to take place. That's a starting point. We need to go in there. And I think it's right as well, by the way, that Labour has said that all EU citizens who have made their lives here, some three million of them, should get to stay. That's very important. And... <laughs> and that we therefore invite the EU to make a reciprocal arrangement yeah, 
for UK citizens. Yeah, but the chief, the chief negotiator says you can't stay in the single market. You can't just think you can stay in and keep all the benefits. It's not possible. So well, Labour's position. That's what is negotiations one of the, are for. Oh, There's 18 mean, months to go. Fine. That's his opening negotiating gambit. Oh, right, okay. We're going to negotiate. Brief word. I'll come to well, you. I, was, I was just going to say that I mean, Labour continues to speak out on both sides of its mouth on Brexit. As somebody who sat in the referendum campaign and had people like John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn cancel interviews at the last minute and then just go on and criticise the campaign rather than passionately campaigning for it. It's just simply not true. And perhaps you can clear something up tonight. Does the Labour Party believe we should stay in the single market, the Customs Union and the European Court of Justice? Because millions of people voted for you thinking that that is your policy. Well, there's a... I've just said that what we want is tariff-free access to the single market. And there's a tactical uh, difference of opinion between some in the Labour Party. Some, means, some think that that means we have to be in the single market, and some think that that means that we can get tariff-free access to the single market. There's a long way to go with these negotiations, but what we want to do with these negotiations is, yes, put democracy first, but yes, also put the economy and jobs centre stage. What we don't want is what the Tories want, which is to try and use uh, Brexit as a smoke screen to create uh, a low tax haven for the super rich off the shores of Europe. But the final thing I'd say is this. The reality is that as things stand, the way the economy is run, whether we're in the European Union or out of the European Union, the majority of people, 99% of people, are still being held back. And that's the problem. Society isn't fair as it is now, whether we're in the European Union or out of the European Union. The, the, the woman up there, in, uh, in the second row in the back, yes. Um, I agree with the previous um, lady's point at the front. Jacob said earlier that he said we knew what we were voting for when we voted in the EU referendum, but I don't believe that a lot of people did. What about the famous slogan on the side of that bus? What's happened to that? We didn't know what... A lot of people didn't understand fully what we were voting Caroline for. Caroline Lucas, do you agree well, with that point? I, I absolutely do agree with it, and I don't think it's patronising. I don't think it's patronising because... The Leave campaigners, the leaders of the Leave campaign, didn't do it by accident. They were very deliberately not nailing their colours to any particular version of what Leave would look like, because they knew if they did that, then they would actually have a divided campaign. So I sat on plenty of panels alongside Dan Hannan, one of their prominent MEPs from the Tory party, who said again and again, of course we'll be able to stay in the single market. Leaving the EU, of course that's possible to stay in the single market. So people didn't necessarily know what a hard Brexit, what a soft Brexit was. It wasn't on the ballot paper. And my point would be that Theresa May does not have a mandate for the kind of Brexit she's trying to pursue. She didn't have a mandate on the 23rd of June because it wasn't there on the ballot paper in the referendum. And she certainly doesn't have it now when she went back to the country to try to get a mandate for a harder Brexit. And it had it thrown back in her face and she's got a smaller majority. So what we are saying in the Green Party is that now that people are beginning to learn more about what Brexit really means and learning, for example, that there is not £350 million going to the NHS every week, if only there were, and indeed, as Craig has already said, the economic consequences of Brexit are becoming clearer, that is why I think it would be right to give the people the right to have the final say on the deal that comes back from Brussels. So when the negotiations are finished, Come back to the people, not just to Parliament, which is what Theresa May is saying. Give it back to the people. You started this process. You should be able to end right. it. If you like it, then go for it. But if you don't, then you should be okay, able to stay in. All right. Jacob, just on that, on that point of, a, of, a, of, a, of the people having a second say, a referendum, and I'll come it's to you say in a moment. The deal. It's not a second this, say, it's a first say on the deal. A first say on this the deal. This is characteristic right. of the EU. Vote in the way that Brussels doesn't like and you have to vote again yeah. until you've yeah. done what they tell you. <laughs> uh, it, it seems to me we had a referendum, we decided to leave, and that must be implemented or we deny democracy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'd like to say I'm sick and tired from the, the well, the younger generation, the younger voters uh, of ageism. Anybody who's middle-aged or above is accused of, of um, oh well, you don't care, you don't matter, your vote doesn't matter. It's us that the, the next that are coming and all this, and then the likes of Caroline and others um, are, are basically accused of not knowing why we voted. My decision to leave was made up a long, long, long time before the, the, the referendum. Like most people I spoke to. That rubbish on the side of the bus, I didn't personally believe. I thought, yeah, we're going to get some of it back, uh, some of those taxes, uh, the money back in, into the, the coffers. But I didn't believe that all that money is going into the NHS. And anybody who believed that 
was stupid anyway. But, sir, there are people out there who voted Leave thinking that that would still allow them to be part of the single market. There are people self-evidently out there who did believe that. I so, so I, I, it's I, I very clear. The people I speak to had made their minds up well before the referendum was called. So what, what did you think of... What, what if people were persuaded by that? What did you think of that, that if, if you think they, it wasn't well, truthful? Well, look at the... Look at the BS that's told by all politicians on all political parties at every general election. All right, well, what do you say to the person in the front here who did say young people are the people who are going to inherit this? What do you say to her? Well, I'm working, I'm a taxpayer. I could turn around and say, well, I'm older than you, I'm, what, I'm wiser than you, exp life, life experience, so my vote counts more in that aspect, my vote's more valuable in that aspect. That which is not fair, but it, it's, okay. it's a comeback. What do you say to him? What says you've got more life experience? Just because you're older doesn't mean you've done that much. What right do you have to, to say to, uh, to older voters, their vote doesn't matter? Those who voted to leave, that your vote doesn't matter because you're going to be dead in, in, in less time than us. My We're... point wasn't that your vote doesn't matter. My point was we didn't vote for a hard or soft Brexit or That's not it. to leave. We didn't know what we were voting for, to leave. There was I no did. definition. Leave no, or remain? There was no I'll go to leave. Why are you voting while I was voting to leave? All right, I'll go to the person in the second row from the very back. And then we'll take one more question, because I think we may be... Yes. Um, I'm a young person, I'm 17 years of age, and I was for Brexit. I think that the media portray us all as wanting to, to remain in the European Union is wrong. Um, I would want to Brexit. And I think if 16 and 17-year-olds were given the vote, statistically, them having 100% turnout and 100% vote to remain would have only just clutched um, remain win anyway. So I don't think it was worth it. OK. And thank you, sir. Thank you. You want to point? Yes. So I'd say um, the very word Brexit itself is rather an empty signifier and in regards to the campaign I think the reason there was no promise to stay in the single market or leave is because the moment you make that promise you isolate voters so if you leave it as open as possible then that campaign is rather more appealing it's not that people don't understand um, it's just that the word itself is kind of all-encompassing I suppose okay let's uh, I think we've got time for one more question let's take uh... This one from Laura, Laura Mawson, please. Should people leave university with £50,000 worth of debt? The issue that came up, indeed, at the election when Labour promised to make university free again. Um, Susie Boniface. No, Laura, they shouldn't have to. And the thing about tuition fees, it's the worst possible deal for the taxpayer. We used to pay for university tuition up front. We now pay in arrears with 3% interest on top, plus the retail price index, which is the most expensive way of judging inflation. Uh, most graduates are only going to start paying for this over 30 years or so after they earn over £21,000. Many of them will be able to will be defaulting long term on that. There'll be debt collectors that we, the taxpayer, have to pay to hound them. And what will end up happening is the total final bill will be paid for by the taxpayer. It will also be paid for by those graduates who are too poor to start paying back their student loans because they didn't get over 21 grand, but they are earning over 10 grand, so they're paying general income tax. Uh, and we all start paying back, and it costs far, far more in the long run. And as someone who um, lectures at different universities around the country, I've got to say as well, I think it creates an idea that education is something you can purchase and that it gets delivered to your brain like an Amazon parcel, and it's just there. And it's not. Education is like gym membership. You can pay for it, but unless you apply yourself, you're not going to turn into an athlete. Uh, and I think that the tuition fees debacle has both uh, affected the quality sometimes of what people perceive their education to be, but it hasn't affected the actual quality they're receiving, and it's certainly led to a worse deal for the taxpayer. We're all paying more as a result of the tuition fees thing. It's not just students who are leaving that debt, it's the general taxpayer that's having to cough the bill. Okay. <laughs> so, um, well, I'd say who would be 18 now? You're staring down the barrel of having a pension that's probably going to be worthless. It's very expensive to buy a house. It's probably out of your reach. And on top of that, you're being asked to have a 50 grand worth of debt before you've even started if you've gone to university. But I think there's a huge problem with this. 
Susie was saying education used to be free. In fact, the reason why it was free was because very few people went to university. We're now in a situation where far more people do. And the Labour Party is saying, well, we can just give it all away free. That would cost £60 billion, £60 billion over the next Parliament. So I think that we should look at, look at the tuition fees and see if there are ways in which we can ease it. It's definitely wrong that people are charged interest while they're studying and they're not earning. But actually what political parties need to do is look far wider than that and have a bigger offer to young people. And I think the Conservative Party probably needs to have a much bigger offer on housing for young people. When I think about it, we see how far backwards we've gone. Someone growing up, a young person in my constituency now, leaving university, has less chance of a debt-free life, less chance of a well-paid job, uh, less chance uh, of a mortgage, less chance of a council house, and less chance of a decent pension at the end of the working life than someone leaving school at the age of 15 in my constituency did 40 years ago. Now, that's not right. So I'm proud that Labour went into the general election that we just had and got 13 million votes, 40% of the votes, on the basis of a policy of free university education with a leader who was always supported and always voted for uh, free education. And we all benefit, we all benefit from education. When we go to hospital and someone treats us who's been to university, we're all benefiting from that. When our children go to school and our children are educated, we're all benefiting from the education of the people who work in the school. And it was alarming to see the report that said that young people from working class backgrounds are coming out of university with more debt than their more affluent uh, counterparts at, student, uh, at university. And that's wrong. And we all know, don't we? We all know that there's uh, working class people bright enough to go to the university they want to, but have to make the economic choice to go to a different university. And that's not a choice, that's not a restriction of choice that the more affluent face. So I'm proud, I'm proud of Labour's policy. Why? why? <laughs> Why, why do figures show more people from disadvantaged backgrounds going to leading universities now than ten, four, five years ago? Well, they're, well they're coming out with more debt on average, no, £57,000. If, 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 if the debt is the problem, why are more of them going to? You because think? people have aspiration, people want to get on, people want to contribute in the best way, and people want to be educated. And I don't believe, by the way, that education is just about being paid more. And once you start charging, especially this amount of money, we're encouraging people to think of university just as a kind of investment that returns a personal, uh, that, that yields a personal uh, financial return at the end of it. I also believe in education for education's sake. Okay. That's really important. You, sir. We all keep saying about Chris Mayer, the magic money trader he accused her of. I think that Labour must have a magic money forest. Because all this stuff they're giving away is unbelievable. <laughs> I think that gentleman's made the best comment of the night. I, I, it's very hard to follow. Um, uh, I think that the, the point you were making, David, is absolutely the key one, that there's been a 72% increase in applications to university from people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And the reason for that is that loans have allowed the number of places at university to increase because they are funded by the loans rather than directly by the government. But what matters is the term of the loan. So yes, there is this large nominal debt, but it only begins to be paid back after people earning over £21,000. It is then written off after 30 years, it does not count on people's credit score, and it is collected through the tax system, so there will be a 9% collection above £21,000. Nobody will have to pay all of that back. There will be no debt collectors knocking on your door if you can't right, pay it back. I didn't get a degree. Uh, after, the only after, person here who didn't need to get a degree. After 30 years, it is simply written off, and it is taken through PAYE. And that means that it ought to be no disincentive to people to go, and you've seen numbers rise. But let's just look briefly at what they do in Scotland. Because in Scotland, it's free. But where have they paid for that from? They've paid for it from further education. So the people who are going to be the elite, who are going to earn over their careers £200,000 more, are being paid for by those who are going to further education, who are going to have fewer opportunities. That seems to me to be outrageous. And you have to decide who pays. 
Is it going to be the people, under very favourable terms, who will benefit? Or is it, ladies and gentlemen, going to be people on the minimum wage who are just beginning to pay tax? All right. That is a choice we the have to face. The second row. <laughs> yes. you. I worked in education with 16 to 18 year olds for over 30 years. I also have three young grandchildren who have all chosen to take apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships, and are all funding their own way in. And I don't feel they are in any way disadvantaged by not having gone to university and racked up huge debts. And I think that the the modern apprenticeships which are on offer now are a huge opportunity for young people mm. rather than right. rack up huge debt. The, right. the woman in pink there in the third row in the pink dress, yes. Um, I, my son is paying off, he's just over the threshold and he's just started to pay um, his tuition fees back. Um, but actually, having paid all year, the interest on it is so punitive that he's ended up owing more than he's paid off. How can that be right? How much is he paying off as a matter of interest? Do uh, you know? oh, I don't know. It was in the hundreds. I can't remember. He's only just over the threshold to start to pay it, it starts at... It's meant to be £90 a year if you earn over £22,000. Yeah. Well, he ended that. up with owing more than he started with. How can that be right? And trying to talk to the student's loans yeah. company is putting, interesting. Putting 6% interest on yeah. a student yeah. loan yeah. is, a, How's frankly, right? a complete it's disgrace. Right. It's just uh, disgusting. And the woman in the third row, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, what I want to know is if um, the Labour Party do get rid of this fee, uh, what about the people that have already paid it? Will they get that paid back right. to them? Right. Well, that's a question for another general election, I suppose. <laughs> Caroline Lucas. So I just thought it's really interesting how Jacob spent the first half of the programme saying that government debt is really bad and we need to avoid it at all costs, and he's just spent the last ten minutes saying that student debt is absolutely fine and don't worry about it at all. Yeah. And I think it doesn't give a good start to our young people when they start off their lives with up to £57,000 of debt. And if you look at some of the issues on university campuses right now, there is an epidemic of mental health problems, people being incredibly stressed about this thought that they're going to have to pay back so much money. It is wrong. This interest rate of 6% is absolutely scandalous. And in terms of what are the alternatives, well, let me just tell you that universities in France, in Germany, in Austria, in Belgium, Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, all charge massively less. It's about £2,000 a year. We're paying, in England, the highest student fees in the whole world. And there are alternatives, because you know what? The people who benefit from an educated workforce, as, as, as Richard said, is, is all of us. But there's also businesses, too, who benefit from having an educated workforce to go and work for them. So why don't we have a, a business education tax that's being called by the union UCU? It'll be a small tax on some of the richest companies. Uh, that will go into it, and it will be something that will be shared that way. Instead of having this idea that a, 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 a university education is some kind of private commodity. It isn't. Right. It's, a, it's a public good. We all benefit from it. Tax people hire by all means when they actually get out of university, but don't put this burden on all of our young people right from the start. The man in blue. <laughs> if you would, a very, very brief, because we have to close the programme. I think there are too many people going to university. Uh, time was when we had apprenticeships, like the lady said down there. <laughs> Higher education for, should be for the brightest people, whatever their background. The rest, we used to have HNC, ONC, HND, would you have load it of free? practical courses. Would you have it free for fewer people or still I think a good solu solution would be getting to university should be academically hard and financially easy. OK. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, on that note, our, our hour's up. It's all from question time until Thursday the 14th of September.